great pleasure to come into the house of God and to be with a gentleman like your pastor and your sister, and I want to thank them for having us here. He took a great risk. Anyone who wears cowboy boots and a buckled brother, you've got to be, care- got to be really careful about them. It's just, you got, you, but he took a great risk because he met me just the once, and, um, and I don't believe you should just let anyone in your pulpit. It could be a wolf in sheep's clothing. You don't want wolves to come and rip your people. You don't need those sort of people. As Pastor was saying, I was um, born in Papua New Guinea. My third language is English. My first one is the village dialect. My second one is near Melanesian. And it sort of goes like this. Also, one of you people come now, and this blah up, now buy me sin down, a ting ting, baton, long big blah up. And so I know you know exactly what I said, but um, I grew up in a, a mission field. My dad was um, 19 when he first went up to Papua New Guinea, just three years after World War II. And um, three young men, his cousin is the one that married his cousin, and um, those three guys were there with their uncle, and they started to, um, well, they started to, to change the face of Papua New Guinea. They um, built roads, they built schools, they built um, houses, they built airstrips, they built everything. My dad built sawmills, he was a builder. By the time he was 19, he'd been working since he was 13 as a builder, so he was a builder. And he went and he built virtually everything up there and, um, in, at the time. And I was born up there in the town, if you call it a town, it was sort of a place where, where the key ups, the key ups of the government officials lived and stuff like that. It wasn't really a town, it was a, next to nothing. It is a city now. And, um, I was born there, and within a week, I was in the bush, in the village. We lived in a village, thatch roof. Um, they make their thatch out of um, mortar, they call it, um, out of some of the palm leaves. And even our, even our windows, we had a stick and used to push them out like that, and there were the leaf that come out like that. And we grew up there, no water, running water, nothing like that. And um, so your worldview becomes one of, it's not your skin colour. Your culture is not your skin colour. Your culture is not the colour of your eyes. Your culture is that which you immerse yourself in the most. So I can tell a Christian what their culture really is. Because when they open their mouth, they talk about football all the time. I know they're not really immersed in Jesus more than football. Nothing wrong with football. Although you do know it's rigged, don't you? It's not about them guys running around kicking hot air around the paddock. It's about the guys at the top making all this. It's not about a game. It's about the money. It's about the betting. It's about all that sort of stuff. I know some of your boys are playing big game footballs, and I love that too. That's all right. As a matter of fact, I gave up football after a while because we went to America where my daughter is, and we started watching ice hockey. Have you seen, anyone seen that on TV or anything? It is one crazy game. You go there, it's even more crazy. They break the perspex sometimes and then they've got to put a new one in and there's blood on the on the ice. Those guys are serious. They can still do the biff even, you know? They can a little not in football anymore. It's gone. I don't know how we got onto football or games like that. But anyway, we went there. Your worldview is what you immerse yourself in. Let's immerse ourselves in the presence of God. Let's immerse ourselves in the Holy Ghost. Let's immerse ourselves where God is and His Word and His will and His presence and we will change this nation because we live in the last days. This is the time. Like I said this morning, this is the terminal generation. There will not be too many more. It's nearly done. So we have a time-sensitive project. It will run out of time soon. Bible tells us, night cometh when no man can work. Don't think that there's four months and then comes the harvest. Harvest is now. And if the harvest is now, we need to immerse ourselves in the culture of heaven. I want to talk tonight about having an encounter. I have three children, a whole heap of grandchildren. They live all over the world. One lives in Florida, one lives in Christchurch, one lives in Brisbane. And they've got, we've got grandchildren all around. 
So we think it might be a good idea to build a house in Fiji so at least we might see some of them quicker, easier that way, because we're halfway in between everything. <laughs> you never know. Having an encounter with God. Many people had an encounter with God, just one touch, just one look, just one immediate in time, one small period of time, and they were never the same again. It didn't have to take ages for it to happen. I had an encounter with a woman. She was a girl, 16. And I met her, she's sitting over there now. I was 17. And it was one of those encounters and my breath came like, you know when you stand on a thorn and you go, <laughs> now you know what I mean. I saw this girl and I thought I'd stood on a thorn. And my whole world changed from that moment when I saw her walking down the back steps of her house. I've had an encounter with a bull. A bull in the outback. A Mickey bull. Who's got cow? You know what a Mickey bull is? Mickey bull's still a young bull. He's almost full grown. He should have been castrated, but he wasn't. But he's still in the paddock and he's still running around, a Mickey bull. He's not really full grown, but he's big enough. And uh, we were hunting. Who's hunt? Who hunts here? No one hunts anymore in Fiji. Do you hunt? People hunt. Do you fish? Oh, that's good. That's good. Day. I love fishing too. I'm a fisherman, man. And, and so we used to hunt with dogs. We'd take two or three dogs out. And um, they were quite big dogs. They'd have a big collar over here with armor over them so that the pig, because we were hunting for pigs, so the boar pig can't cut them up because then you have to sew them up and sometimes they don't get home in time. And, and so we used to do a lot of that in the outback. And we were hunting one time with the owner of a property who had, I mean, he had miles. He had nearly 200 kilometers that way and about 80 kilometers that way. He had land. They have big paddocks over there. And um, we'd, But we were right on the edge of it on a creek and the creek had some water some places, mostly not because it's the outback. And... Um, we were going along looking for pigs, and next minute this Mickey bull stands up, and we see. I said, and the guy says, "Hey, can your dogs catch a bull?" And I said, "Well, we don't normally let them because we don't like them catching cows. They should only catch pigs, and they're trained to catch pigs, not cows." He said, "But if they catch them, this is worth money to me. This is because the Mickey bull did not have a brand on it, and in the outback, if you're close to your paddock, it doesn't matter. Then." If you find one without a brand and you catch it, it's yours. That's the rules. A matter of fact, in the outback, you, when you go and get your cattle, which you do once a year, you muster about half a kilometre on their side, and when they come, they muster about half a kilometre on your side of the fence. Why? Because then they go through them. All the ones with your brand, they just flick back through the fence. But if it's got no brand, they keep it, because it's theirs, and that's the rules. So he said, we better catch this bull. I said, okay, maybe, the, maybe the, the, the dogs will. So we held one back. We let two, big, two of the big dogs go, two of the male dogs. And they went, and sure enough, they caught the bull. Straight on the nose, one's flying around, and the, one's on its ear like that. So we ran up. We put a belt around its leg, threw it on the ground. And then the, the guy who was the owner of the paddock, owner of the, of the property, he then castrated the bull and then cut a piece out of its ear so that he could prove it was his. He couldn't master it, so he cut the mark in its ear. But then you have to let the bull up, don't you? How are you going to get away? And these dogs are hanging off it because they're trained never to let go until the, until the thing dies, you know. They're not going to let go. So we got the dogs off. We took them away. My brother was with me. My youngest brother also was with me. There were three of us. So I, so I said, I'll lay on his shoulder and hold him down. You guys get the dogs and get away quick. So they got the dogs and get away quick. I'm still lying on top of this bull and he's sitting there. <laughs> And he's a little bit cranky by now. I mean, and he's had an operation that he didn't want. He didn't order that operation and it's in pain. So we let him up. I let him up. I jumped up, let him up and ran around behind a tree. He gets up. He looks around. He sees these, this brother and this other guy about 100 yards away. He didn't chase me. He took after them. He took after them and these two guys in a little tree trying to get away from this bull now. So I've had an encounter with a bull. It wasn't all that good. 
I've had an encounter with bikies. We were in the outback ministering to Aboriginals. We did that for over 22 years. And um, we ministered all over the outback. And while we were, while we were there, we were driving from one place. We'd driven about 400-odd kilometres early morning in a little car. And we'd come down and we'd got onto the main highway where the bitumen was. And we had three little children in the back. And... Um, so we got out and we put the billy out. You know what a billy is, don't you? Just a thing to boil, a tin to boil your tea in. We lit a fire. We started boiling the billy for a cup of tea and have some breakfast with the kids. And along came about 12 or 15 bikies. So they come along and they've got some helmets, some haven't. They've got all their colours on them. And, they, and this place is remote. It's maybe 90 or 100 kilometres to the next, next house, let alone... Anything else, Australia is huge. And then there's another 80 or 90 k's that way to the next town. So they pull up next to us. They stop just up the road from us. They didn't need to. And I thought, these guys are trouble. They're going to have, they're going to just do something stupid. Sure enough, they get off. They start swearing. They're urinating on the road. They're doing stuff. They come across towards us. They started walking towards us. But I had a little secret weapon. In that car, we had two, two little hooks. And hanging on that hook was a thing called an M1 military carbine with a 30-shot chrome magazine. It'll make a hole in you as big as my finger if it hits you. And we used it for killing things in the outback and shooting things to eat and whatever. And um, it was just sitting there. So I, as they were coming towards me, I just reached down underneath it, pulled it out, and put it on the bonnet of the car. Well, those big, swearing, tough boys turned around, went back, got on their motorbikes, and gave me some... Interesting waves as they left. <laughs> An encounter with a bikey. In your life, you will have encounters with all sorts of people and situations, but the greatest encounter you can have is to have an encounter with God. And when you have an encounter with the Holy Ghost and fire, you will never be the same again. What the world needs today is to have an encounter with the Holy Ghost. We need the Word, but we need the Word and the Holy Ghost. You see, the Holy Ghost is here tonight, but Jesus isn't. The Father isn't. The Father's in heaven sitting on the throne. Jesus went back when He was finished His work on earth and sat at the Father's right hand. The Holy Ghost is here tonight to do a work in your life and in my life again. One encounter with Him will change your life. Let's look at Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6. Verse 1, and it says this, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne, high and lifted up, and His train filled the temple. He said, I saw the Lord. I encountered Him. That word there, I saw, the, the word saw means to comprehend, to really see, to view intensely. I viewed intensely the Lord. It's almost like it's so strong a word, it's like this. If there was an elephant here and it stood on your foot, or you, you told me, I think an elephant stood on my foot. I would think you're stupid. If an elephant stood on your foot, you would know. When the Holy Ghost turns up and touches your life and puts his finger on your heart, then you will know, hallelujah. He said, I comprehended it. I saw it. I know what happened, Isaiah said. I, saw, I didn't just think I saw it. This wasn't just a vision. I saw him high and lifted up, hallelujah. When the Holy Ghost touches your life, you know you saw him. You know he's touched him. If you have to say, well, I think I'm born again, you aren't born again. If you say, I think I'm filled with the Holy Ghost, you're not filled with the Holy Ghost. Because when God touches your life, you know it. When you get healed by the power of God, you know it. Because you're walking and leaping and praising God. He said, I saw, I comprehended, I really, really knew. It's almost like the same thing in Job. I think it's about 42, he says, 42, 8. Oh, don't take, but it's over the back of the book of Job. And he says, um, I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Now I, I've heard it. 
I, I didn't just watch it. I saw, before I watched it on TV, I read it on Facebook, I saw it somewhere else, but now I have been touched by your power. Now you have touched me. I will never be the same again. Now my eye sees you. I comprehend you. We need people who have comprehended the Father. We need people who have been touched by the power of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. We need a, a breed of women who stand and men who stand in our, in our churches today and go forth from our churches with the power of God in their hands and the Word of God in their lips. Hallelujah. One touch from heaven and you'll know it. One touch from heaven and you'll recognise that you can't do it on, their, on your own. Verse 5 says, So I said, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. When you get a touch from God, you're not depressed, you're not living in death, you're not living in doubt, but now you have been set free. Now there's power in your hand. Something changes because the one who made you now has touched you. And it goes on to say there, Isaiah, Isaiah goes on to say, then one of the seraphim flew, having a, in his hand a live coal, which he'd taken with tongs. I find this very interesting. I find it interesting from a lot of, lot of aspects. But the thing I find interesting is that the angel could not hold the hot coal. In his hand. He's a supernatural being. He could not hold it in his hand. He had to get an implement to hold it, tongs. But when it touched his lips, he could touch his lips. It did something good. So a supernatural being couldn't understand and couldn't hold the power of God, but you and I as his servants, the power of God, the heat from heaven can come within us and do a work within us and not kill us, not harm us, but do us good. I, I see some things sometimes in the Word that, that boggle my mind. Why is this so? Let's go over to Ezekiel chapter 8 just for a few minutes. Ezekiel also encountered God. He said this, It came to pass in the sixth month, the sixth year, the sixth month, on the fifth day of the month, as I sat in my house with the elders of Judah sitting before me, that the hand of the Lord fell upon me. When God's hand falls upon you, you know it. But one other thing, I, something I noticed about this, when you have an encounter with God, I've never forgotten the place. I, can, I could take you back to the place where that bull was. I've only been there a couple of times. I could take you back to that place where, that, where the bikies, we met the bikies. I can take you back there. I know exactly where it is. I'll never forget it. Because I had an encounter. When you have an encounter, you never forget. Ezekiel never forgot. He knew the day. He knew the month. He knew the year. He knew who was sitting there with him. He knew the time of the day. When you have an encounter with God, you'll know when it happened. Hallelujah. You'll remember it. And when you bring it back to your memory and start to talk about it, it'll, it'll be the same again. The anointing will hit you again. It will start to affect you again when you just even testify about it. You'll get emotional all over again because it is something that is eternal. It wasn't just in time and space. You remember the exact time and space, but it wasn't for time and space. It's something eternal that happened. When you have an encounter with God, you will know when it happened, where it was, who was there. The elders of Judah sat before me. He knew who was there. He could have told you. And he didn't even take a photo and put it on Facebook. One touch from heaven, and the fire burns with a live coal within you. One touch from heaven, and you recognize it, you're a sent one. Go back to our text, original text, 6 1 of Isaiah. 6, about 8 now. Also, I heard a voice saying, Who will, will I send and who will go for us? <laughs> it's almost like when you were in school. Who, who, who will do this? You remember in school when the school teacher asks questions and you had to put your hand up? Remember? 
The Lord's saying, who will go for me? Whom will I send? And it's almost as if Isaiah's saying, pick me, pick me, pick me. Just like we were at school. He has been touched by a coal and he'll never be the same again. He's been touched by the fire of God. He'll never be the same again. God doesn't have to say, look, I need someone to go and start a church at such and such. Who will go? And everyone's going, oh, I don't know about me. We'll, we'll get a committee meeting. We'll work out who will go. No, you've been, you've been touched by God. You're ready to go. Hallelujah. You, no one can stop you. You're not asking how much are you going to pay me to do it. You're going to say, how are you going to stop me? Wild horses won't keep you away from doing what the will of God is when you've been touched by the fire of God. God's fire burns so strongly within you. I remember going back a few years now, just before my dad was, was dying and we went home. And for three, three years, we hung around and looked after our parents. And mum's still alive, uh, but dad's gone now to glory so, quite some years. And... Um, we just hung around and we weren't preaching anyway. We came from um, Central Africa at the time and preaching up to six, seven times a week. Sometimes we'd do um, leadership seminars that start on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, all day. Not this nonsense about, you know, one session in the morning and one at night. No, the Africans are hungry. You start at nine o'clock, you preach right through to one o'clock. They have something to eat. By two o'clock, you're preaching again till five o'clock, preaching and teaching. And some of them rode on a push bike with no tubes in it. They put grass inside the tubes. They rode for two days to come to listen. So we came from that and we came home to Australia to look after our, our mum and dad. And suddenly we're not preaching at all. Suddenly we're not doing any ministry at all. Suddenly there's nothing happening. But I want to tell you something, the fire still burns. You can't get away from it. When you have a touch, if the coal touches your lips, you're good for nothing else except for what God has called you to do. I want a, I want a band of people who are good for nothing else except to do what God's called them to do. Because in that, they were doing exactly what they were created to do. In that, they were, they were called exactly what they are called to do. One touch. And you'll re recognize that you're a sent one. Whom will I send? Who will go for me? It says there, he says, Here I am, send me. Then God said, Go and tell this people. Go and tell this people. We have a message for the world. We have a message for the world. We have, but we can't take the message until the fire burns. You see, Trying to reach the lost without the Holy Ghost is like trying to, to make your fridge run without the plug plugged in. It doesn't work. It's devoid of power. This message was designed to go forth in power of the Holy Ghost. Anything else is dangerous. Anything else is in weakness. Because anything else bottles down to humanism. What I can tell you, what I know about something. That's just this human telling you something. But when the Holy Ghost is upon it, it's what I can tell you that's loaded by the fire of God and it changes people's lives. It brings power. That word there, power is dunamos or donamos. In one of the languages um, in Central Africa, they, they used, when they said power, they would say mpamfu. And I had a, had a, a little um, interpreter interpreting for me one time, Sam. He's now a preacher and he's got a great church down in Mozambique. And um, it, this was in Malawi. And um, he was, and, and so I started just, every time I, I heard that word, when I said power, he said mpamfu. It's a strong word, mpamfu. It's like it's got something in it. So I started keep saying power so I could hear the word umpumpfu. But the gospel is the umpumpfu, the power of God under salvation to them that believe. The dunamis, what it really is, it means miracle working power. It's devil chasing, hell shaking, heaven bringing, coming down power. It's miraculous power. That's what dunamis is. 
The gospel is the power of God unto salvation to them that believe. Let's go over and see another man of God, a great man of God. Exodus chapter 3. Moses. Moses was a very educated man, educated in all the schools of Egypt. Moses was quite rich at one time in his life. Moses had everything he wanted. He had guards to take him whenever he wanted. If he wanted a little, little tussle with somebody, he could take whoever he wanted to. He had whatever women he wanted if he wanted them. He had whatever food he wanted. He had the best cars. Forget about driving a fielder. He had the best cars. Forget about a Toyota, Lamborghini, Contash, or one of those sort of things. He had whatever he wanted, the best camel. But it still didn't help him set his people free. He tried to in the flesh. He tried to do it. He had the right um, concept. My people shouldn't be slaves. They should be set free. And there's a lot of Christians who have the right concept of the gospel. Our people should be set free. But he did not have an encounter with God. Then one day it all changed. When he had given up, when God had taken him to the backside of the desert, don't have to go to the backside of the desert to do it. I've lived in the backside of the desert. We lived so far in the desert one stage, my, my Toyota Land Cruiser had two fuel tanks, had a water tank underneath, had two spare tyres, not one, had roof rack on the top, had a place to sleep, had every, had a, had a HF radio that when you got out past where radio, uh, telephones wouldn't work, you could talk on that back to base. We had everything on that thing. And in the one time we were lost, I mean, I was lost. I followed a guy. Interesting story. We were coming from the sea on the south, a place called Sejuna, and we were heading back 1,600 kilometres back to Alice Springs, and we took a shortcut through, which was fine. But then the guy I was following, he said, we'll go along the railway line. The trouble was one railway line went that way to where we were going, and one railway line went and that way to Western Australia, Perth. It was overcast, no sun, so we couldn't see which was east or west. So I'm just following him. He was going west. Now we're 300 kilometres west of where we should have been. And he's got no fuel in his car. Lucky I had two tanks. We did one tyre. Lucky I had two tyres to get back to where he was going. So I came back and I, I'd seen something on the way because we drove along a railway line and then on an offshoot of a railway line, there was two large tankers, railway tankers, that they carted diesel with. And so I came back in the night and I came back there, no one there, absolutely no one there for miles. I mean, hundreds of kilometres, not one soul. A few dingoes and some rabbits out near Maralinga, where back in the 60s the English came down and they exploded their bombs and tested their nuclear stuff down there. Nobody lived there. And um, so I came back there and we filled up my jerry cans, I filled up my car and I took some back to him and we ended up coming back and finding our way back. But the reason we could find our way back and knew where we were was this HF radio. And I talked to one of my friends in Western Australia by it. He was another two and a half thousand kilometres away. I talked to him on it and he said, where did you see, what did you see after a while we worked out? We're heading for Perth, not the right way. So we found our, eventually found our way back home. He turned aside in the desert, the Bible says. In, in Exodus chapter 3, he turned aside to see the fire of God. The key to having an encounter with God is that you turn aside and touch him. I, I spoke this morning about sowing into the anointing, how a little woman in Shunem sowed 
She sowed food into the anointed one, that is the prophet, so he would come to where she was. How she sowed all sorts of things and she sat before him. She gave him food. Then she built him a house and she sowed into that anointed one so he would come where she was. And how we should sow into the Holy Ghost so he will come where we are. It's not about, come Holy Spirit, I need you. That's a false song. He doesn't come like that. You sow into him and then he comes. He doesn't come to you from nothing. If he did, he'd come to everyone down the street. He comes to those who search diligently, search after him, my Bible says. Seek after him. We've got our doctrine wrong if we think Holy Ghost is just going to come and do something. No, we must go after him. Moses had an encounter when he turned aside. Turned aside from the things he was doing. Turned aside to the thing that even made him eat. He was a shepherd at that time. That was his job. He turned aside from his job. He turned aside from his daily vocation. He turned aside from the things of life and he found and had an encounter with God. Then and only then could he go and set the people free. We've got a job to do, but we won't set them free without having an encounter. And I want you to notice with me, where was the first place he took the people? He brought them through the Red Sea and he took them to Mount Horeb. Why? Because Mount Horeb was the house of, was the mountain of God and it wasn't very far from where he met God. A good leader has an encounter with God and brings his people back to where he had the encounter. Hello? That's what he did. And all the time, Moses did not say, I'm taking my people to the promises. He said, I'm taking them to the presence. Stop taking people to the promises of God. Take them to the presence and the promises will come automatically. Because in the presence, there's fullness of joy. In the presence, there's healing. In the presence, there's renewal. In the presence, there's mighty things happening. Without it, there's nothing. Stop preaching the promises. Stop promising people God's going to do this for you. No, promise them. If you come into the presence, you'll have an encounter with Almighty God and you'll never be the same again. When you have an encounter, your motives change. You get a little smarter. Hallelujah. Some people here tonight may have been and done many things. You may have had things that knock you down along the way. You may have encountered some hardships and other things, but the greatest thing is to encounter the presence of God. You might say, but pastor, it's just, you know, all these things have happened. A little story about two friends. And they went to the great art gallery where they lived. And they went together. They hadn't seen each other for quite some time. They went together. And they went to the art gallery and they started looking along the walls and looking at the great things that were there. And they got to a certain place and one of them stopped. And he started looking at this this picture. He just couldn't get away from this piece of art. And his friend went on and looked at more and looked at more and looked at more. And came after a while he came back, he said, what are you doing? There's more to look at. He said... I can't get away from this, this great piece of art. The piece of art was, was called Checkmate. And it was depicted two men. One man looked like a normal man sitting at a table with a chessboard. The other man was made with a pointy tail and horns on it, as if he was the devil. And the one that was on the other side, the devil was gloating, and the, and the, the sign up the top said, on the bottom of the, of, the, of the painting said, checkmate. And the guy said to his friend, he said, there's something wrong with this painting. He said, what do you mean? He said, they have to either change the name on the bottom or they have to change the painting itself. He said, what do you really mean about that? He said, I am one of the world's greatest chess champions. And I've looked at the chess board. God's been looking at your chessboard. And the king has one more move. 
It wasn't checkmate. The king had one more move. And it doesn't matter where you are in life. It doesn't matter if you've had problems with your relationships, you've had a a sudden divorce, something's happened in your business, all sorts of things may have come against you. The wind of, of hell has blown against you itself. I want to tell you something tonight. The king has one more move. And he wants to have an encounter with you tonight. He wants to touch your life.